So, what is a simple machine? Uh, one definition simply says that a simple machine is a device or tool which makes work easier. We recognize for this event the six classic simple machines. Uh, and they are the inclined plane, the wedge, <coughs> the lever, wheel and axle, pulley, and the screw. Not the screw you expected to see up there, is it? That's actually uh, Archimedes' water screw. But it's still true. And we're also going to talk about compound machines because much of what we're going to deal with is going to be a combination of two or more simple machines put together to do the work. So, what does a simple machine do? Simple machine increases the usefulness of a force by changing the strength of the force, how far the force moves, how fast it moves, the speed of the force, or it changes the direction of the force. So we said that the simple machine helps you do work. So this is the first formula that you need to know. That we define work as force times distance. If there are no friction losses, the ideal machine, <coughs> then whatever amount of work is applied to the effort has to equal the apply up of the work done at the load. We use the formula work in equals work out. Substituting the prior formula within that, we get input force times the distance the input moves equals the output force times the distance the output moves. For our purposes for this event, all simple machines are going to be ideal machines. There will be no, we will totally ignore anything having to do with friction or anything else like that. We will use the ideal condition for everything. Okay, when the force applied to the load is more than the effort to move it, we call that mechanical advantage. And mechanical advantage is generally expressed as a ratio. In this case, the force out divided by the force in gives you a mechanical advantage. If it takes you one pound of effort to move two pounds of load, you have a mechanical advantage of two. Now, we, we talk about if force, in, force out over force in gives you that uh, mechanical advantage ratio, you could also use distance in divided by distance out to give the same mechanical advantage. After all, the distance is directly related to the force. Now there's a trade-off whenever you do this. If in order to increase the force on the load, you have to increase the distance that the effort moves. Think about that. You, the effort moves farther so that you can move more weight, more of a load. Now, if the effort moves farther, it also moves faster. Just kind of file that in your brain there. Okay. Sometimes, depending on the machine, we will actually give up mechanical advantage. We will give up that force in order to get speed or distance. That's one of the trade-offs that we use. And sometimes, uh, 
there may be no change in the amount of force or the distance moved, but what will change and what we're trying to accomplish is to change the direction of the force. Okay. So, let's go back to our simple machine. So let's look at each one individually. So how does an inclined plane work? By the way, this is the only one of the simple machines that never moves. That's the distinct, That's how we tell the difference between an inclined plane and a wedge. An inclined plane never moves. The load moves, but not the inclined plane. We determine the mechanical advantage of the inclined plane by comparing the length of the ramp, the slope, to the height. Because the mechanical advantage in this case is the difference between the force it takes to push the object up the ramp compared to lifting the object straight up. That's where we determine the mechanical advantage. That's, that's what the inclined plane does for it, for us. It allows us to move the load without having to just literally lift it straight up. Okay, so. You can determine an approximate mechanical advantage for the inclined plane simply by uh, measuring the length of that slope and dividing it by the height of the ramp. Now, how does, how does the wedge work? Now, in this case, it, the wedge has to move. The effort, in this case, is applied to the wedge as opposed to the to the inclined plane where you're applying the effort directly to the load. Okay. In this case, we do change the direction, but we change it by roughly somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 degrees, give or take. <laughs> Depends on how, um, how narrow the wedge is, and we don't need to really worry about the exact number. Just kind of you get the idea. You're going to prep in this case, you're going to pound down on the wedge and it's going to cause the log to move sideways apart. Okay. The easiest way to estimate the mechanical advantage here is to compare the length of the wedge to the widest part of the wedge. Again, you get a nice ratio. Uh, uh, just sort of eyeballing the picture there, it looks like that wedge is about three times long, longer than it is wide. So roughly, uh, it a mechanical advantage of roughly three. Now you notice I'm talking averages here. I'm talking approximate. It's because you kids are never going to have to give me an exact number. I want you to be able to, to estimate the mechanical advantage so that you can compare how the mechanical change, advantage will change with an increase or decrease should we change the size of the parameters of the simple machine. Okay? All right, let's move out. Levers. And a real nice, nice quote from Archimedes, I mentioned him earlier. And he said, give me where to stand and I will move the earth. And of course, the implication there is that he also has a lever long enough <laughs> and a place to stand. But yeah, in fact, sometimes you see the quote as, uh, give me a lever long enough and a place to stand. But uh, that's not the truth. Okay. So, levers. Levers, we, we, talk, we recognize three parts to the lever. The effort point, the fulcrum, and the load. Let's talk about levers. Now, first class lever. Now, just so you know, I, I, I'm going to talk about first, second, and third class levers. At this point, I don't expect to ever ask you to identify them by first, second, or third class. As long as you can figure out how they work, uh, I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm not, there's not going to be a question on the test that says, you know, is this a first, second, or third class level? I'm not going to do that. I have a hard enough time keep, trying to keep it straight myself. All right, but first class level. 
The character specific characteristic of this is that the fulcrum's in the middle with the effort applied on one end and the load at the other. This machine always changes the direction of force. You push down on one side, the load goes up on the other. It may change the strength of the force depending on the positioning of the fulcrum. If the fulcrum is absolutely dead center, it's not going to change the amount of force. But it's off to one side or the other, it can be either greater or less. Okay? It may also change how far or how fast the force moves. A second class lever is one where the fulcrum is all the way at one end, the effort's at the other end, and the load is in the middle. Now, this does not change the direction of the force. You lift up on the one end to lift the left, uh, the effort goes up, well, so does the load. It also moves up. This, this class of lever will always increase the force on the load. And, of course, the effort always moves farther and moves faster than the load does. Our last one is the third class lever. This also does not change the direction of the force. However, and you can see it actually requires more effort to move the load. The effort will be greater than the load. So you have a mechanical advantage of something less than one. The purpose of this type of a lever is to gain distance or speed. Okay, quick definitions. The fulcrum is the support about which the pivot moves, or the, uh, the lever pivots. That. <laughs> uh, the effort arm, this is a, a measurement we make. This is from the fulcrum to wherever the effort is applied, whatever that length is. And the load arm being the distance from the fulcrum to where the load is. We, est we can estimate the mechanical advantage of a lever by comparing the length of the effort arm to the length of the load arm. Now, I only show the first class lever here, but if, if this were a second class lever, where the fulcrum's all the way, take the load of the fulcrum and kind of reverse positions on those. Uh, your effort arm is still, from wherever the effort is, all the way to where the fulcrum would be, and the load arm from the load to the fulcrum. I probably should have thrown up an extra slide or two here. <laughs> but, uh, so anyway. Uh, also, my formatting got a little bit off, but okay. So, oops, that's not what I have to do. <laughs> okay. So, typically, the mechanical advantage is the easiest way to calculate it is to measure the length of the effort arm and divide that by the load arm. Okay. So, let's move on. The next machine is the wheel and axle. Uh, this will also always change the strength of the force. It will change how far and how fast the load moves as compared to the effort. But it does not change the direction of the force. Whatever, whatever direction the wheel rotates, the axle is going to go the same way. So it's not going to change the direction. Now, how do we uh, estimate the mechanical advantage? The easy way is to compare the diameter of the wheel to the diameter of the axle. And again, you get a ratio. Now, I will say one thing here. Uh, by convention, the effort is always applied to the wheel. 
but I'm sure many of you can think of an example in the real world where that would make the wheel smaller than the axle. And from a physics mechanics point of view, or a mechanical engineering point of view, the effort is applied to the wheel, and the axle is where the load is. But in the real world, we always call the wheel whichever one's bigger. <laughs> Don't let it bother you too much for the competition. You're just going to be comparing the two. And um, I don't think you'll have any problem with it. But again, the mechanical advantage uh, is determined by comparing those two uh, diameters. Okay, pulleys. Ah, pulleys are fun. Okay. The pulley may increase the force on the load. It may change distance from speed, and it may change the direction. All depends on which way you've got them set up. The pulley on the left, uh, in this picture, does not change the force. If, if that weight is two pounds, you're going to have to pull with two pounds of effort to lift it. What that machine does do is it changes the direction. On the other hand, the pulley on the right <laughs> doesn't even do that. You pull up in order to get it to pull up. Now, the easy way to calculate the mechanical advantage of a pulley system is to count the number of parts of the rope that support the load. Here's an example of a pulley system with a mechanical advantage of two. If the effort has to pull six inches, each of those two strands going around the bottom pulley are each, it's going to shorten by three inches on each side to take up the six inches, right? So you're going to pull down six inches, the load's going to move up three. You get a mechanical advantage. You, you double the, you half the distance and double the force. Okay. Here's our couple of examples. Here's one that show on the right, I'm sorry, on the left, that shows a mechanical advantage of three. In this case, if you look closely, you'll see that the top <coughs> pulley is a double, where the bottom is a single, so that you can get the extra strand. The pulley on the right uses two doubles, double pulleys, and of course you have four strands supporting the line, the load, and your mechanical advantage is four. Now you can prove this by, you know, getting a ruler out and using force gauge and everything else, but I'm giving you the kind of the shortcut here. <laughs> okay, screws. Now, a screw may change the strength of the force. In fact, it usually does. But depending on the how far the screw moves for each revolution, that may or may not be true. And it may change the distance and speed. What it does do is it does change the direction of the force. You're changing a rotating effort changes to a linear motion. About nine, roughly nine, again, 90 degrees to uh, the effort. <coughs> Estimating the mechanical advantage of a screw is a little more complicated because what we're going to compare is what's called the pitch of the screw to the circumference. The pitch is quite literally just the distance between one thread and the next one. Um, and is how far the screw will move laterally for each revolution. And of course the circumference, easiest way is to measure the diameter and multiply by pi. I think you, most of you should have some idea how to determine the circumference. However, 
If you have two screws with the same pitch and one has got a larger diameter than the other one, then it's going to have a little more, it's going to have more mechanical advantage to it. Uh, the circumference, of course, will also be larger. So, anyway, that's just to give you a rough idea how this, how to determine mechanical advantage on each machine. So, look at some various uh, objects and uh, let's see if we can figure out what simple machines are involved. So, what do we got here? A wheel. Yeah, there's a wheel there. What do you see? A wheelbarrow. Well, it's a wheelbarrow, yeah. What simple machine? Yeah, in the blue.
Lover, definitely. What class of lover? I know I wasn't going to ask you on the test, but what do you think? First class. Yeah, first class. Because you're going to put one kid on one end, and that's going to be the effort, and he's going to lift the load, or the second kid on the other end. Pivot point in the middle. <laughs> Well, the little support there, yeah, that's where the fulcrum is, yeah. Okay. That's what might be a little more difficult. <laughs> what do you see? Well, there's a screw. There's definitely a screw running through the middle there, isn't there? And is there anything else in there? What do you think? I'm sorry? Yeah, lever. Those things are levers. Okay. Now, it's not pictured here in the in the picture here, but usually, you know, this is this is an automotive jack. And when you use this type, you've got to have a handle, and it's sort of usually a crank type thing, so then you'd have a wheel and axle. But since it's not in the picture, it doesn't count. All right, what, what do we got here? Oh, let's see. Yeah, what do you think? A wedge. Well, definitely a wedge. What else do we got? Lever. Lever, okay. Now, here's, here's a good question for you. If, you. if this is being used as a lever, where's the fulcrum? What do you think? Anybody else got an idea? Where's the full? Where would the fulcrum point be? Yeah. Yeah, you. Right up there. <laughs> no. <laughs> Think about you holding the knife and using it. Where would the fulcrum point be? Actually, your wrist. Your wrist is the fulcrum. Okay. Which makes it a third class lever. Which you won't be asked to identify. Which, which you won't have to know, that's right. Okay, now everybody's hands up on this one. I'll save you the time. Incline plane, right? Yes. Everybody agrees? Okay. Oh. All right. What simple machine have we got here? Yeah, you. Wedge. 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 Yeah, I might call the tip a wedge, but what else have we got? Yeah, you. Um, we have a lever. No, I don't think so. Well, it all depends on how you're using it. If you're going to use it to open a paint can, yeah, maybe it's a lever. <laughs> well, let's, let's think about how it's supposed to be used. Yeah, you. Um, a wheel and axle. Sorry? A wheel and axle. Yeah, wheel and axle. Now, here's a question. Do all of those screwdrivers up there have the same mechanical advantage? Why not? Right over there. Yeah, you. Yeah, different sizes in what way? Um, the length of the metal part. Now? Yeah, you. Uh, because the one bit, one, it says that I think there's a tab, and so that way to that one, I think. What do you think? For the sake of the recording, repeat wrong and right answers. So oh, okay, I'm sorry. Please. Yeah. Now, the reason, the reason they're different is because the diameter of the handles is different. Not all of the screwdrivers have the same diameter of handle. So they would have different mechanical advantages. All right, so what do we got here? This ought to be an easy one. 
<laughs> yeah, you. Yes, an inclined plane. That one's an inclined plane. That was easy. Okay. Another one of those combination type ones here. They're definitely a screw. Okay. What else is in there? And a wheel and axle. That's right. That that handle out there acts as a wheel and axle. Gives you additional uh, mechanical advantage. All right. Y'all know what these are? Nail clippers. Yeah. So. Oh, let's see. They're definitely levers. Yeah. What else is there? And there's the wedge. Now, if we ignore the one going up, and we just talk about the, the two pieces that have the cutting edges on it, we probably have a third class lever there. And you'd have less than one mechanical advantage. But the other piece is a second, is a, another lever with a much greater, that's a, a first class lever, with a much greater mechanical advantage. Or no, actually, I think that would, I think that would classify as a second class lever. Because the pivot, yeah, the fulcrum and the load are very close together, but the load is inside the fulcrum. So, anyway, and that's where we get our advantage there. Okay. All right. What do you see? Oh, definitely a pulley. Yep, yep. That's the one I expect everybody to kick first. What else is there? What do you think? What do you think? Wheel and axle. No, that's the hill. What do you see? Wheel and axle. Well. That's not really what I'm going for. Actually, what I'm going for is that, that that boom going all the way up is also a lever because it can change. And fulcrum down here, and the uh, effort's applied almost all the way out to the end with load at the very end. So we've got a number of options there. All right. All right, yeah, this is going to be an odd looking one for most of you kids, probably. <laughs> Unless you've been out for pioneer days or something. Uh, right there. Yeah, do it. A lever? Well, yeah, there's a lever there. What else is there? A wedge. Yeah. Now, everybody see, does everybody see where the lever is? Yes. So the fulcrum. It is over here where it's going to get attached to a, a horse. <laughs> and the farmer is going to be able to, to change the height of the, of the plow by lifting up or pushing down, and that's how the lever works. And of course, the plow itself is a wedge. Okay. <laughs> now I'm trying not to ignore everybody. Way over there, what do you think? I can't hear you. Nah, no pulleys there. The yellow shirt all the way in the back. Yeah, you. Screw? You get no screws. Huh? Well, yeah. That's one of the reasons I probably wouldn't use this in the competition. There's too many things in the gray. Um, is there a lever? Yeah, there's a lever. Now, first or first, second or third class, what do you think? <laughs> now, right, where's the where's the fulcrum? The fulcrum is where there's that pulley. Hmm? Like okay. The fulcrum is up here. Now the load goes in the pan, and in this case, you've actually got three lever bars going out there. And if you're 
going to try to calculate the mechanical advantage, you'd have to calculate each weight on each one of those three bars and how far out it is to get uh, force and distance and add them all together. Probably not. Okay. <laughs> no, they're not. You're unlikely to see anything like this but, in the competition. Too much for the competition, guys. Yeah, but it's a nice exercise to look at this stuff, real world things, and see what you can figure out. Okay. <laughs> what do you think? A wheel and axle. Yeah, wheel and axle. Wheel and axle is what you can actually see. If I use this in a competition, I probably and you put down screw, I'd have to give it to you because of the threads on the end of the faucet there. If I was doing this in a competition, I'd probably pick a faucet that didn't have that. Um, now, if you could see inside the faucet, you'd find screw a screw mechanism inside. But yeah, right now we're mostly looking to see the wheel and axle there. Okay. First of all, do you know what this is? Got an auger. But yeah. Uh, and red black there. Yes. Wheel and axle and screw. And although it's hard to see, if down here at the bottom, if there was a point, then we'd have to give you a wedge, too. <laughs> is this a simple machine? Yes. yes. No. No. Yes. yes. What do you think? Yeah, you. Uh, yeah, it's an inclined plane. It's an inclined plane. It's kind of an odd looking inclined plane, but it still works like an inclined plane. Okay. This one's a little bit of a ringer. Now, you have to understand how this uh, object is used. It's called a raft, and generally you use it to file away, to take away bits of wood. So, and the rat over there. Definitely a wedge. In fact, a whole bunch of little bitty wedges. Every tooth of that file is a wedge. Okay. All right, so the whole point of that exercise is to get you to start looking around at things in the real world. Let's talk about the district and the county competition real quick. Um, there are going to be 10 stations. You're going to get two minutes per station. Uh, all the tests are going to be multiple choice. Uh, I will provide scratch paper and rulers. No calculators allowed. Basically, a kid should show up at the door with a pencil. And you'll be just fine. And knowing how to fill out a scan drive. Yeah. So, what we're going to do now, what I've given you there, the sheet of paper you have are the questions for station one and station two. So this was station one, <laughs> pair of scissors. And the first six questions were whether, you know, what simple machines were found in the objects. And of course, there were levers and wedges. Everything else should have been no. Uh, at which label point is the force applied to the load? That would be at C, and the effort is at A. And the question, does any part of this machine change the direction of the force? Well, yes. <laughs> Each of the two levers that make up the pair of scissors are uh, both class A, or first class levers. And, of course, the wedges are also going to change the direction. As they cut the paper apart, they're going to force, force it apart. So they change the direction. Excuse me. Yeah. Are you going to use 
load and effort in all of your... Yeah, yeah. Load and effort are the terms I will use. Yeah. Thank you. I know sometimes you'll see uh, effort and resistance, depending on the website you look at. But we'll use load and effort. All right. Uh, so, station two. Here, we should have marked screw and wheel and axle. Okay, does any part of this machine change the direction of the force? Well, the wheel and axle part doesn't, but the screw does. Because as you rotate it, it pulls it into the socket. And, of course, it's force on the load less than or greater than the effort applied, greater than that, that large bulb gives you a fair amount of mechanical advantage. Uh, even the screw part also gives you a fair amount. And so, of course, the effort and uh, moves both faster and farther than the load does. So, 